This is episode number eight with Dr. Michael Bruce. Make sure that not just that you're going to bed at the same time, which is about 50% of the game, the really important factor is waking up at the same time. Eight hours is a myth. It's very individualized. Having sex at night from a hormone standpoint is actually probably the worst thing you could possibly do. What's up? Thank you for joining me for another episode of Anchors of Health. I'm your host, Bill Choi, and this episode is under the recovery anchor because it's all about sleep with Dr. Michael Bruce. He's the author of The Power of When. This was a fascinating interview loaded with tons of practical advice from start to finish. We talked about chronotypes, which he explains, five things you can do today to get better sleep, the eight-hour myth, what your nighttime routine should look like, foods to eat before bed for better sleep, the best time to have sex, the best time to ask your boss for a raise, and so much more. In fact, there was so much we covered, I created a little cheat sheet on all the action items he talked about so you can put it into action right away. If you want that freebie, all you got to do is head over to anchorsofhealth.com slash eight and you can get it there. I took notes for you so it's very simple to remember and take action on. So quick bio on Dr. Michael Bruce. He is a clinical psychologist and both a diplomat of the American Board of Sleep Medicine and a fellow of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. He was one of the youngest people to have passed the board at age 31 and with a specialty in sleep disorders is one of only 163 psychologists in the world with his credentials and distinction. He's also on the clinical advisory board of the Dr. Oz show. He's a regular on that show. He's also been interviewed on Oprah, The View, Anderson Cooper, The Doctors, you name it. He's helping the world get better sleep and today he's helping all of us get better sleep. So let's jump right in. Here's Dr. Bruce. Dr. Bruce, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to talk to you. I did a combination of reading and listening to the audio version of your book, which by the way, was great to hear you actually reading it. Fantastic job on that. Thank you. It took a while. It was was four days in the studio, eight hour days, just listening to myself read it. It was wow. definitely a new experience. The book is called The Power of When, Discover Your Chronotype and the Best Time to Eat Lunch, Ask for a Raise, Have Sex, Write a Novel, Take Your Meds, and more. Fascinating book. And I will say for me, it really helped me to become more aware of when I'm at my best in all these different areas of my life. And not only for me, but it also gave me a better understanding of my wife and just people in general when they function best. So a lot of people talk about what to do and how to do it, which is important, but you address something that is often overlooked and that's when to do it. Can you talk about what made you look into the timing of things? Absolutely. Um, So it's kind of interesting. So I've been an actively practicing sleep specialist for my entire career, almost 18 years now. And, um, you know, one of the things that we learn about in school and through our practice is something called circadian rhythms, right? So these are the internal rhythms of your biology. Um, and, you know, historically, we, we used to look at them mainly around sleep. And we knew that there were some people who were early risers. We knew that some people who would sleep at, you know, not go to bed until very late at night. Um, and so we had to try to identify if those people had a disorder, something called delayed sleep phase syndrome um, or advanced sleep phase syndrome. Uh, And then we would try to treat those types of uh, syndromes using things like light therapy or melatonin uh, exercise, things of that nature. But it kind of started to dawn on me uh, after a while. And in my first book and in my second book, I addressed this a little bit, uh, which was the idea that, uh, you know, some people are on a different clock. You know, it, it's, it appears as though some people's bodies seem to function in a different way. And, you know, everybody out there knows somebody like this. They know somebody who, you know, doesn't show up at the party until 10 o'clock and then can stay up until 2 o'clock, right? Um, or they know that person that, oh, it's 8.30, you know, John's going to be heading to the door soon because he's usually in bed by 9. Um, and, uh, and so it started to kind of dawn on me, like, hey, maybe there's more to this Um, And maybe there's a way that we could look at different things that might influence us in our daytime, not just necessarily our sleep. So in again, in my first two books, I address things like eating um, and weight loss and sex and things like that. But I really didn't make a deep, deep dive until now. And so what I did was um, I enlisted a couple of my friends and I said, you know, write down every activity that you do during the day. And we, we were able to get together a list of about 50 different activities. And then once we had that, 
started to look at the literature on morningness and eveningness, right? So early birds and night owls. And by the way, these are, these are called chronotypes. Um, and that's a big fancy word, but all it means is morning, early birds and night owls. But what I discovered over the course of time was there aren't just early birds and night owls. There are early birds and night owls. Then there are people that are kind of in between. And then there are people with insomnia that have a super crazy schedule. So I, I decided, and, and I've been seeing patients like that for a long time in my career. So I said, you know, there's got to be a way that we can categorize people. Because once we kind of know what category we're in, then we can start to make better recommendations for them. So I decided to create a quiz. Now, there are quizzes out there for early bird and night owl, but there really wasn't any quizzes that included insomnia, that included kind of in the middle and what we call sleep drive. Uh, and so I said, you know what, let's do it. So I created a 35-question quiz. So for folks out there, if you want to take the quiz, it's free. You go to www.thepowerofwhenquiz.com. Dot com and that'll be in the show notes for you um, and you can figure out what your chronotype is and so I named them based on animals um, and I took animals from the animal kingdom that actually support this sleep schedule so if you're an early bird you actually turn into a lion uh, we know this because lions uh, actually had their first kill is usually at dawn they're very early morning creatures by two o'clock in the afternoon they're lying on a tree branch asleep um, the middle group, people who are not such early people, are used to be called hummingbirds. Um, I call them bears. Um, bears have a tendency to be solar sleepers. They get up when the sun comes up. They go to bed when the sun goes down. Um, so they're kind of more of a normal uh, schedule sleeper. Uh, then I, I chose wolves for the night creatures. And I, by the way, am a wolf. I am a night person myself. Um, and uh, uh, because wolves are primarily nocturnal. Um, they kill at night. They're very active in the, in the later evenings. And then I chose dolphins for my insomniacs because um, there's a little known fact that um, dolphins sleep unihemispherically. So they sleep with half of their brain at a time while the other half is looking for predators. So I thought that was kind of an interesting representation of, um, of an insomniac, right? Somebody who just doesn't get, you know, is never fully asleep. Right. And so once we created the quiz, um, then it was time to discover what the right times were to do different things. So that was very interesting. So how much data did you find on all this? You would be shocked at how much data there is on this. I found over 300 studies, literally 300 studies, um, looking at morningness, eveningness, uh, insomnia, these different categories, these archetypes, if you will. Uh, and so I was able to match them up. And so the, the whole notion of the book is kind of like this. If you're a lion, an early morning person, and we know that you wake up around 5, 5.30, well, your melatonin shuts down, your cortisol goes up, and you're ready to start your day. Here's what's so fascinating, Bill, is that everybody has hormones in their body that are on a very predictable schedule. And so when you look at something like, let's say, cortisol, we know that it will spike right after you wake up. It'll stay elevated for about... Mm, 60 to 90 minutes, then it slowly starts to curve down. Then you'll see a second spike during a later part of the day. This is incredibly predictable. So then what I did was I took those 50 activities that my friends had outlined, and I, I looked up what hormones do you need at high levels to do each one of those activities, and then I just matched it up. Um, and it was amazing because when you look at a lion and they wake up early versus a wolf who wakes up late, they could be two or three hours different in their hormone levels. And so then I would tell them to schedule whatever activity they wanted where they needed those hormones later for the wolves and earlier for the lions. It's actually pretty simple. Super cool. And it makes so much sense. Now, what percentage of the population make up lions, bears, wolves, and dolphins? So it's interesting. So when we look at lions, um, lions tend to make up about 15% and let me give you a little couple of characteristics of lions, because we actually know a good bit about lions and their, and their personality, if you will. So lions have a tendency to be my leaders. These are the people who are my COOs. These are the organizers of companies. Um, lions have a tendency to make a list at the beginning of the day and go from step one to step two to step three. Um, they have a tendency to be what I call type A personalities. You may have heard that term before. These are you know, uh, aggressive go getters, you know, the, again, leaders of the company, they're great managers, by the way, they're not so great at getting stuff done, um, as much as they are in management and being able to motivate people to get things done. 
Then you have the bears. Bears represent about 50, 55% of the population. Um, now, be careful out there, folks, because um, one in two people is a bear. Bears are the best, by the way. Um, and here's why. Bears have a tendency to be a little bit more extroverted. Um, they're the fun people to hang out with at the party. Um, these are the people that do get the work done. Um, and, uh, and they're a great group to kind of hang out with. Um, but bears can also be a little lionish or a little wolfish, right? So bears might be almost like a hybrid at times where you might have a bear who fits all the personality characteristics but gets up at 5.30 in the morning, right? Or one that likes to stay up until midnight at night. Don't be alarmed by that. Again, it's, it's like a continuum, if you will, for bears. Then you get into wolves, and I'm a wolf. I'm a night person. Um, I rarely go to bed before midnight. I'm usually up around 6.30, 7 o'clock. Uh, and that is a schedule that I have had almost my entire adult life. Wolves, we have a tendency to be very creative people, um, but we also have a tendency to be a bit more introverted. Um, we are not the people who are the life of the party. We're, we're the people who kind of hang back. And then, by the way, we don't get to the party until about 1030 at night because we're wolves. We don't, you know, that's our time. <laughs> um, and uh, it's interesting. They make up about 15 to 20 percent of the population. And then dolphins... Uh, again, who are my problem children, my problem sleepers, if you will. These are my type A personalities. However, they have a tendency to have a little bit of obsessive compulsive nature to them. And oftentimes they will work so hard on a project that they can't complete it. Um, at, nothing's ever done. They're sort of perfectionists, if you will. Um, they make up about somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the population as well. Yeah, so I took the quiz and I turned out to be a bear, which was pretty spot on for me. And my wife awesome. is also a bear as well. Um, but if someone takes your quiz and they're saying to themselves, eh, this doesn't really sound like me, what could be the reason for that and, and what should they do? So it's interesting. So there's only so much you can assess with 35 questions on the internet. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so one of the things you can do is um, look to your parents. So ask your parents to take the quiz or um, ask your parents if they, if, they, if they have a tendency to be more of an early person or a night person or kind of a middle person or an insomniac. You know, this is a genetic predisposition. So this is all based on the what's called the PER or the period three gene. So the length of that gene dictates your sleep drive and oftentimes the timing of your sleep. Um, and so while it may not feel um, like, oh my gosh, they hit me spot on. Remember, there's a little bit of play, especially for bears, where they can lean more towards being a wolf or lean more towards being a lion. But I would tell people all the time, number one, Check your parents because they will have a tendency um, to lead you in a direction. Number two, I don't know if anybody out there ever does that 23 and me, um, but that's a, a genetic testing service. Um, they actually have a report in there that will tell you if you have a tendency to be more of an, a morning person or an evening person. That's another way to do it. Um, and then in the book, I actually give you a very sophisticated way, which looks at um, looking at your core body temperature and seeing when it rises and falls. So we'll get there. Um, it just may not hit you on the first try with the quiz. And then I will say one other thing with the quiz is some people, when they're answering the quiz, they answer the quiz based on a schedule that is inflexible, right? So if you have to be at work at 6.30 in the morning and you're waking up at you know 4.30, does that make you a lion? No, not necessarily because you're being forced to do it. It's kind of when people are taking the quiz, they need to think about what would they be if they were allowed to naturally get up and go to sleep, things of that nature. Right. Um, that, that can also have something to do with it as well. That's an excellent point. So I went through this period a few years ago trying to wake up super early, like 5 o'clock every day, and I was able to do it for a while, but I just wasn't able to stick to it. So is it possible to change your chronotype? So the answer is yes, um, but it's hard. Um, so remember, this is genetically predetermined. Once you get about age 20, your chronotype is pretty stable until you reach about age 55 or 60. Um, but children at various ages also actually have very significant chronotypes. So as an example, I have two teenagers. I have a 15 and a half year old and a 14 year old. And um, both of them are wolves. And most teenagers are wolves. And what I mean by that is, and folks out there are going to know what I'm talking about. I don't know about anybody out there, but I have a devil of a time waking my children up in the morning. And I'm the sleep doctor, for God's sakes, right? I mean, <laughs> I, should be, I should be dialing this in, but, you know, genetics are tough. Um, and, you know, it's not so easy to wake kids up at 6.30 in the morning, right? They're not really up for that. So a lot of times 
we're looking at that as a possible um, you know, uh, situation where it, it has to do with age. But during your adult years, you should remain relatively stable. Then once you kind of hit the age 55 or 60, we start to see something different happen. What we start to see there is that people have a tendency to become either dolphins or lions. Um, and there's two reasons for this. People have a tendency to become dolphins because they become more medically unstable or frail. So there's hypertension, there's diabetes, there's something else that's going on that can have an effect, um, or um, uh, medication that they're taking can actually have an effect on them. And then finally, uh, and that's where they turn into dolphins, um, when they turn into lions, has, is a natural progression where most people above the age of 55 or 60 have a tendency to wake up much earlier uh, and go to bed much earlier. Yeah, you're spot on on those teenage years because I remember growing up, I, I swam 12 years competitively and I remember my mom waking wow. me up super early for swim meets while my two brothers were comfortably sleeping and I would absolutely hate it. It was the worst. Yeah. <laughs> I, could, I, I could have really used your book back then. <laughs> I'm sure. Now, regardless of chronotype, what's the single best thing you'd recommend people to do to start getting better sleep tonight? So there's, I have a five-step program um, that's super easy, and I want to tell everybody about it. So step one is picking a schedule and sticking to it. Right Now, I would request, if possible, take the quiz, figure out your chronotype, and then that will help you understand when you should go to bed and when you should wake up. But there's a simple way to do it for people who are uh, awaiting the book or who haven't had an opportunity to get the book. You take your socially determined wake-up time. So just to make the math simple, let's say it's 6.30, right? Mm -hmm. Then you count backwards seven and a half hours. Now, why would I choose seven and a half hours? It turns out that the average sleep cycle is roughly 90 minutes long, and the average person has five of those sleep cycles. So five times 90 is 450. And if I divide it by 60 to get the per hour, it turns out to be seven and a half hours would complete roughly um, five sleep cycles. So number one, eight hours is a myth. All right. So people out there who are thinking, I got to get eight, I got to get eight. You don't. It's very individualized. Um, so if you count back seven and a half hours from 630, that, that means that 11 o'clock is your new bedtime. So I call this the bedtime calculator. Now, I'll be honest with you, uh, Bill, I tried this on myself and it failed miserably. And let me tell you why it failed. I, I, uh, I wanted to get up at 6.30, so I went to bed at 11, but I woke up at 5.30. Then I went to bed at 11 the next night, woke up at 5.30 again. And so I said, well, this is ridiculous. I'm going to go to bed at midnight. I went to bed at midnight. Lo and behold, I woke up at 6.30. So what I discovered was is that my sleep cycles are shorter. They're not 90 minutes long. They're actually about 78 minutes long. And that's what pushes me to having a shorter amount of total sleep time. Now, genetically, I just happen to get lucky to only need six and a half to seven hours of sleep. Um, but find your time and figure it out and then make sure that not to just that you're going to bed at the same time, which is about 50% of the game, the really important factor is waking up at the same time. Um, so it turns out that if you wake up at the same time every day, including the weekends, you have less of a chance of circadian shift. So people should never, ever, ever, if they can avoid it, sleep in on the weekends. You really can't catch up on sleep. That's a myth as well. Um, and it's really not the best idea. So step one is to pick a schedule and stick to it. And the most important part of that is the wake up time is getting up at the same time during the week as well as the weekends. Step number two has to do with caffeine. So I oftentimes am asking my, my patients, look, I need you to stop drinking caffeine by about 2 p.m. Why 2 p.m.? It turns out that caffeine has a half-life of between six and eight hours. And so what I want people to do is if you stop at two, that means at least half of the caffeine is out of your system by about 10 o'clock at night, which is about the average time that many people are getting in bed. Turns out the average uh, U.S. bedtime is around 1030 at night. So I want at least half of the caffeine out of your system. Otherwise, it could have a pretty significant effect on your ability to fall asleep at night. So step two is to stop caffeine by 2 p.m. Step number three has to do with alcohol. Now, I am not the guy to tell you you cannot have alcohol. <laughs> I like beer. I like bourbon. I like scotch. Um, not that I drink it all every night because I don't, but I do like on the weekends to be able to have an opportunity um, to relax a little. Here's what's really interesting is it takes the average human body approximately one hour to digest one alcoholic beverage. So step number three is to stop drinking alcohol roughly three hours before lights out. 
this is what I'm doing here is I'm giving you approximately a two drink, two to three drink kind of um, maximum, if you will. And then if you can stop roughly three hours before, most of the alcohol is out of your system. Because remember, there's a really big difference between going to sleep and passing out. Right. Right. So we really want to we want to avoid the passing out side of things. We want to keep the good sleep side of things. And and we know that once you pass approximately three alcoholic beverages, that also has an effect on your ability to get into stage three, four sleep, which is the physically restorative sleep, as well as REM sleep, which is the mentally restorative sleep. So, again, step three is to stop alcohol three hours before bed. Step four has to do with exercise. If you're looking for a way to improve your sleep, the single best way to improve sleep is with daily exercise. Now, of course, talk with your doctor and make sure that um, that you're safe to exercise, that you're well enough to exercise. But if you are, then my request is to, if you can, stop exercising approximately four hours before bed. Um, there's a group of people out there that when they exercise, they seem to get energy. And so that can, that can be a big issue for them is that they get revved up, if you will. Uh, so we want to try to avoid that. So step four is to stop exercise four hours before bed. And then step five is every morning when you wake up, you should um, go outside and get 15 minutes of sunlight. So it turns out that sunlight is called something called a Zeitgeber. But the most important thing that everybody out there needs to remember is sun, when it hits your eyeballs, it turns off the melatonin faucet in your brain. So if you have morning fog, if you have a hard time waking up in the morning, the quicker that your eyes can see light, the more the melatonin faucet will turn off, and then it makes it for an easier morning. So what, to go over it real quickly again, step one, stick to one schedule. Step two, stop caffeine by 2 p.m. Step three, stop alcohol three hours before bed. Step four, stop exercise four hours before bed. And step five is uh, 15 minutes of sunlight every morning. That's great advice that people can start doing right away. Now, I want to give our audience some examples. What should an ideal nightly routine, and you kind of touched on the morning routine a little bit, but what should that look like? So I created this, um, this rubric, if you will, that I call the power down hour. So everybody, once you've figured out what your appropriate bedtime is, count backwards approximately 60 minutes. So let's, let's say for argument's sake, let's take me. My bedtime is midnight. Starting at 11 o'clock, Here's what I want to do is I want to take that 11 o'clock hour and I want to break it into three 20-minute segments. 20 minutes for stuff you just got to do, right? So whether that's sending out the final email. Um, in our house, it's getting the kids' backpacks together, finding shoes, getting sports equipment lined up for the next day, that kind of thing. Then at 20 minutes for hygiene, so brush your teeth, wash your face, change in your pajamas, maybe take an evening shower. Um, and then... The third 20-minute segment is reserved for meditation and relaxation. This can be prayer. This can be reading scripture. This can be a full-on meditation. This could be a relaxation exercise. It could be a good time to have sex. It could be a time to read. Uh, Maybe even if it's a time to watch television, but something to help occupy your brain and relax you into a state of sleepiness. The big thing here to remember is in order to enter into a state of unconsciousness, you need to have your heart rate at roughly 60 or below. So during this 20 minutes, we want to get you there. People have to remember that sleep is not an on-off switch. It's more like slowly pulling your foot off the gas and slowly putting your foot on the brake. There's a process that has to occur, and we need to give your body time in order to get to that process. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That does make sense. Now, there might be some people out there that have like light coming in the bedroom from outside or maybe it's uh-huh. a night light or yeah. you know, maybe even a bright clock. How right. important is it to sleep in complete darkness? So if you have sleep-related issues, the darker, the better, okay? But let me tell you what happens in my bedroom every night, okay? So I get in bed. We have a king-size bed, okay? I have a French bulldog that sleeps right next to me. I have a chihuahua that sleeps next to the French bulldog. Then is my wife. Then is a cat, okay? (laughs) There's a big screen TV, and it's on almost all night long, all right? And I'm the sleep doctor, for God's sakes, right? So what is going on in my bedroom? Here's what's going on is the light doesn't really bother me. Now, I have an eye mask that I travel with, Um, And sometimes I might use it at night, but my wife told me when we got married, she said, I've got to tell you something. I cannot fall asleep without the television on. And I was like, yeah, 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 I'm a sleep doctor. I'm going to fix that for you. I don't know anybody out there has tried to fix something in their partner. Generally (laughs) speaking, it doesn't go over particularly well. 
Um, and so I was never able to cure her, if you will, of that. And what I discovered was she's not actually watching the television. She's listening to the television, sort of out of what I call the corner of her ear. And so her eyes are closed. She's listening to the television. And it's just enough of a distraction so that she doesn't think about the things that are bothering her during the day, daily stressors and things like that. So in our bedroom, there's a lot of light that, uh, that could be having an issue with us. Now, one of the questions that you may be interested in is blue light. So many people out there may have heard that the idea that there are, um, are all of our devices, laptops, cell phones, televisions, have this blue light that emanates from them. And that is correct, it, it, it does. Um, the reason I'm okay with television is because television is all the way across the room, all right? And 99% of the time, people's eyes are closed when they're listening to it anyway. The problem I have is when you're watching Game of Thrones on your iPad, you know what I'm saying, or on your laptop, because the proximity is much closer. You're about uh, you know, 18 inches to 24 inches away from your eyeballs, so that blue light is definitely coming in. And if you remember when we were talking earlier, we were talking about sunlight in the morning. The reason that sunlight in the morning turns off the melatonin faucet is because of this blue light that's coming in. So you really don't want to have blue light at night. You want to try to avoid that as best you can. Uh, for me, um, what I do is I've actually uh, got special light bulbs in my bedside table lamps. Um, these are made by a company called Lighting Science. Oh, yeah, I so got those too. Yeah, great. Yeah, they're awesome. Um, so folks out there, we'll put it in the show notes. It's www.lighting.science. And they're called the Good Night Bulbs. They're about 25 bucks a piece. So they're, they're not, you know, ridiculously expensive. And um, I have them in there. And then I can read, do whatever I want. And the blue light is already blocked. So I don't have to worry about that. Um, if you're not interested in the bulbs, I personally also use blue blocker glasses. Um, my favorites are uh, from a, a guy named uh, James Swanwick. They're called Swannies. Uh, and we'll get you guys a link for those as well. Um, and what's interesting about those, and by the way, I have my kids wearing blue blocker glasses wow. and it really works. My son loves them. It's kind of funny because he said he does so much of his work on the computer for school. He says that he has a tendency to even wear them starting at like eight o'clock at night because he said that it, he has less eye strain from looking at the computer all the time. So I, I really like the idea of blue blockers in the evening. Um, but yes, darker is better. But again, our body will have a tendency to adapt a little bit. Yeah, and something else I, I kind of like too is that flux on your computer. That's a great one Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Flux is a, is a must-have for anybody out there for sure. Okay, and I'll have that in the show notes as well. Now, in your book, you also talk about the timing of taking a shower and how this affects your bio time. How can people use showering in the morning or evening to their advantage? So it's interesting. So um, for folks out there, uh, there's some, there is a good bit of data looking at alertness and cold. Um, and so uh, what, we've, what we've discovered um, is that um, if, if you do have a slight bit of cold in the morning, um, then it can be very alerting. And so what I do is I take my normal shower, but then for the last one minute of my shower, I face the shower and I have the shower head hit me right in the face. Okay, my, obviously my eyes are closed, which means I have to keep my mouth open in order to breathe. So it's kind of this meditative state that I get into. And then I slowly start to make the shower cooler and cooler. I don't make it ice cold because there's nothing fun about an ice cold shower. But if you start to make it cooler, what ends up happening is blood will shunt to your trunk, and, meaning your torso. And that's actually a very alerting process. And so um, what I would suggest for people do is try this one minute cool down as the last minute of your shower, um, and you'll be pleasantly surprised at how much more alert you are. Now, let's talk about naps. What's the optimal time length for a nap, and when should people take it? So napping, depending, it all depends upon what you want to do. Um, so, depending, so different naps appear to have different... Uh, values for people in terms of doing different things. So, for example, a nap that has REM sleep in it um, is great for improving your creativity. Um, a nap with stage three, four sleep in it um, is good for um, is good for memory. Uh, so, it really kind of uh, and physical restoration. So, it really depends upon like what kind of nap you're looking for. Um, but that being said, I would tell you. Um, that generally speaking, I like my naps to be shorter in duration. So about 25 minutes. You don't want to go over 25 minutes when you're napping because if you do go over 25 minutes, that's where you have a tendency 
um, to see um, people feeling worse from the nap, not better. Mm -hmm. So what I'm oftentimes talking with people about is keep your nap short, number one. Um, and there's actually a perfect time of day to nap. Between one and three in the afternoon turns out to be a perfect time of day because there's a very small drop in your core body temperature, which is a signal to your brain to release melatonin. So there's a very small um, increase in uh, resting melatonin levels somewhere between one and three in the afternoon. So if you take a quick 25-minute nap then, that's going to be the money. That's really going to be what's great for you. And I'm going to teach everybody a really cool nap hack. Um, and so it's called a nap -a latte and so here's what I have people do is you take a cup of drip coffee, uh, which has the highest caffeine content. And stick a couple ice cubes in it so you cool it down. Drink the whole thing as quickly as you can and then take your 25-minute nap. When you wake up from that 25-minute nap, you will have gotten just enough stage two, uh, stage one and stage two sleep to reduce that sleepy feeling. The caffeine is about to kick in. You're, you're good for four hours, guaranteed. Awesome, awesome. And speaking of coffee, and you, and you mentioned this earlier as well, you know there's going to be people listening right now that are saying caffeine doesn't affect them and that they can fall asleep right after drinking coffee. What's your response to that? So I get this all the time, right? Um, and it's, it's really interesting to kind of dial this in. So it turns out that there's different... Um, sensitivity levels to caffeine, number one. Um, and so some people are less sensitive than others. But here's what's interesting is I always, invariably, when I tell people this um, caffeine thing, um, I always say, and now I know there's probably 10 people listening or in the group that I'm talking to that say, oh, sleep doctor, he doesn't know what he's talking about because caffeine doesn't affect me. Here's what the two things that we've discovered is, yes, there are different caffeine sensitivities. However, if you drink coffee too close to bedtime, caffeine is a, is a neurostimulant, hands down, which means if I attach electrodes to your head uh, while you're sleeping and you've got caffeine on board, you're not going to get the quality of sleep that you're looking for. Your brain will stay in stages one and two, and you're not going to get into that deep, more refreshing sleep. So yes, you may be able to fall asleep, but the quality of that sleep is probably not so great. Gotcha. Now, are there any specific foods that people can eat before bed to improve their sleep? You know, it's interesting um, to really kind of think about food and sleep. In my second book, The Sleep Doctor's Diet, Lose Weight Through Better Sleep, we talk about the metabolic process, how that metabolic process can have an effect uh, on sleep and how sleep can affect the metabolic process. Um, there are certain foods that are more sleep-friendly foods, right? So obviously high amounts of sugar, um, high amounts of caffeine, things like that late in the evening are not such a great idea. There is some data to show that carbohydrates um, before bed, uh, roughly 90 minutes before bed can be very helpful. So if you're looking, if you're a snacker, so I'm a snacker, especially a late night snacker, you're looking for about a 250 calorie snack. You want it to be about 70% carbohydrates and about 30% protein or fat um, and you want to, you know, keep it to a low roar. You don't want to go crazy and eat, you know, three pints of ice cream type of thing. Um, but you do want to have, again, 70% carbs, about 30% protein slash fat. Um, and there's a lot of data to show that that can actually be quite helpful for sleep. What's an, what's a, a reasonable example of that? Cheese and crackers, uh, non-sugar cereal with, uh, with skim milk. Um, maybe a piece of toast with some nut butter on it. Things like that can be very satisfying at night, but also uh, be quite helpful for your sleep. And you also have this uh, banana tea, right? Oh, yes. My favorite is banana tea. So um, for folks out there who are looking for something other than chamomile tea or some of the herbal teas that are out there, um, it turns out that magnesium has a uh, very sedative effect on many, many people. Um, and bananas are loaded with magnesium. But it turns out that the peel of the banana has th almost three times the amount of magnesium as the fruit itself. So here's what I have people do is go out and buy an organic banana. Wash it off, cut off the tips, cut it in half, leave the peel on and the fruit in it. Take about three cups of boiling water and drop in your banana and boil it until it turns brown, which should be about three minutes. Then take the water. OK, and then drink the water. You don't worry about the fruit. I mean, you can eat the fruit. It's fine. Um, but drink the water. I call it banana tea. You can add a little honey or cinnamon to taste. It's loaded with magnesium. You really got to like bananas, by the way. Um, but uh, it's absolutely positively uh, a knockout. Great stuff. I got to try that tonight. Now, yeah. <laughs> let's talk about melatonin. Are people misusing this hormone? What do you recommend with this? 
They are. Um, so it's very, very interesting. Um, so first of all, I'm glad you identified it as a hormone um, because many people don't even realize that melatonin is a hormone. I mean, let's be honest. You wouldn't go to your local health food store and buy testosterone or estrogen, right? But yet you can find melatonin literally anywhere. Um, so I think, number one, we have to be careful and understand that this is a hormone. Number two, most melatonin is actually sold in an overdosage format. Um, the appropriate dose based on the data out of MIT and Dr. Wortman um, is between a half a milligram and one and a half milligrams. So that's a really important thing. 95% of melatonin is actually sold in an overdosage format, well, which is rather disturbing uh, when you think about it. So taking the right dose is important. Also remember that melatonin is not a sleep initiator. Melatonin is a sleep regulator. So melatonin affects the circadian rhythm. It does not make you feel sleepy. That's an entirely different system in the brain that makes you feel sleepy. So that being said, once you kind of understand that aspect of it, you need to take your melatonin approximately 90 minutes before bed, right? Because you've got to give it a time for plasma concentration levels to reach that level um, when you need it there. So a half a milligram to one and a half milligrams 90 minutes before bed. Now, who should take melatonin? Absolutely, positively, no children should take melatonin. Very interesting study uh, discovered that at high dosages, melatonin is actually a contraceptive. Ooh, not good. Most people don't know that. So I can't think of anything worse for a young female developing body than to introduce a contraceptive at a very young age. I don't know what the consequences would be, but I'm certainly not willing to do it in my daughter. I can tell you that for sure. Um, so again, melatonin, not for children. There is one exception to that rule, however, and that is with children who are on the autism spectrum. Um, there has been a good bit of data to show that higher dosages like three, four, and five milligrams are, can actually be very effective for children uh, that are on the spectrum. So that's kind of the one little caveat that I have to say to people. But uh, melatonin is great for jet lag. It's not for insomnia. Um, if you've got insomnia, there's a whole different thing that's going on there. Melatonin, again, is a sleep regulator, not a sleep initiator. So um, if you're going to try melatonin, again, at the half a milligram to one and a half milligram dose, approximately 90 minutes before bed, um, but it's really going to be best for people who have jet lag, shift work sleep disorder, things of that nature. So speaking of jet lag, what can people do to minimize jet lag outside of the uh, melatonin? So this is a tough one. Um, because jet lag is very complicated. It has to do with direction that you're traveling. It has to do with your sleep schedule in the place that you're going to and the place you're coming back from. I will tell everybody out there, there is a new app that's going to be coming out within the next couple of months called Time Shifter. Uh, and this is a really cool app where you can actually plug in your current time zone, where you're going, and it will actually give you all of the recommendations uh, based on a proprietary algorithm that's coming out. So um, that's certainly one resource. Me, personally, I keep my blue blocker glasses with me when I travel, and then I also have a light box that I keep with me. And then I actually use light therapy to help me out. So um, I, what I would tell people to do is there are a lot of jet lag apps that are out there. Um, I don't know any of them that actually are, are, have got a sleep specialist who've actually developed them. So look for time shifter, number one. Number two is um, bring along a light box. Because remember, what's happening is, is your brain thinks it's one time zone, but your body is in another. So if you give your brain light, it can turn off melatonin when it's supposed to be off and then turn it on when it's supposed to be on. So that's usually what I use. Unfortunately, it's kind of complicated, so it's hard for me to give people like a one, two, three uh, methodology here. Um, but check out that Time Shifter app when it comes out. I think you'll find it pretty interesting. Right, and you give more details in the book so people can check that out in the book. I um, do. I give a lot of details in the book. Right, so we've gone over a lot of things right now. Let's get to the question that everyone wants to know. When is the best time to have sex? So every single podcast, every single interview, every single journalist wants to know the answer to this question. So here's what's interesting is generally speaking, not even just looking at chronotypes, but generally speaking, if you, if you want to know what's going on there, here's what you need to think about. What are the hormones that we need in order to have sex? Well, we need testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. We need adrenaline and we need cortisol, right? We need all of those to be high and we need melatonin to be low. I'll give you one guess what your hormone profile looks like at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. Oh, melatonin is shooting up high. Exactly. It's exactly the opposite of what we want, right? Right. Um, having sex at night from a hormone standpoint is actually probably the worst thing you could possibly do. 
Um, so you heard it here from the sleep doctor. Morning sex is my prescription. So everybody out there, turn to your partner and let them know you want to try something out. You want to try having sex in the morning. Because here's what's going to happen. All of the hormones that you need will be elevated. Melatonin will be lower. We're finding that people find that there's a better connection with their partner. They're finding that their performance is better in general. Um, and it's working out quite well. The part of the book that's, I think, equally as interesting as understanding morning sex versus evening sex is what happens if you are a lion, a morning person, but your partner is a wolf, a night person. I actually created a matrix inside the book to teach you exactly when, and I give you an early evening time for sex and a, more, and a specific morning time for sex that'll work out just fine. So everybody out there should check it out. You'll be happily surprised at how well it works. And good luck to all the parents out there with kids that are lions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So here's something I found to be very interesting in your book, and that's when to talk to your kids. When's the best time for this? So it's really interesting. It depends a little bit on their ages. Um, but, you know, talking to your children can be a very important thing. I I'd like to relate a, a personal story um, that I have about my daughter. So um, we had moved to Los Angeles about two years ago. And uh, this last uh, a year ago, um, actually this September, she started a new school. And um, she had a bus ride home. And so I would pick her up from the bus when I was in town. And uh, I would say, Carson, how was school today? Fine. Did you make any new friends? No. Who'd you sit with at lunch? You know, Jane. Like very monosyllabic one word answers, right? <laughs> then I would walk into her room at 1030 at night. Now, remember, she's a teenager, which makes her a wolf or a late night person. And I would ask her the exact same three questions. I'd be in there for an hour and a half. Wow. Because her timing, she was ready to talk then, right? And so I have discovered a much easier way to connect with my children, which is talking to them late at night as opposed to early in the morning. So if I'm up and getting them ready in the morning, I'm barely saying a word. It's more like, what do you want for breakfast? Have you got your backpack packed? Let's get in the car. Like it's very low level of communication in the morning, much higher levels of communication in the, in the early and later evening, and it works great. Um, this is great for teenagers. Um, as you get younger, there's different times as well, and I go into extreme detail on that in the book. Great stuff. That's going to help a lot of parents out there. Now, we, we're almost out of time, but let me just see if I can shoot off a few more. Let's just jump to the next one, asking for a raise. When's the best time for this? <laughs> <laughs> So this is always a fun one. So there's actually data looking at happiness. And what we know is that Friday turns out to be the happiest day of the, of the week. Not a big surprise there, um, but we need to narrow it down. So first of all, um, people seem to get progressively happier and happier until they hit Friday. So number one, Friday is the day if you're going to do it. Number two is you want to know what your boss's chronotype is. Now, how on earth are you going to figure that out? Well, number one, you can have them take the quiz, but the likelihood of getting your boss to take the quiz is probably pretty small. So what's a better idea is look at what time your boss arrives at work. If you've got a boss that's there and firing out emails really early in the morning, then you have a lion on your hands. If you've got somebody who kind of just gets in at 8.45, then they're probably a bear. If you've got somebody who's constantly late in the mornings and doesn't seem to really perk up until the late afternoon or early evening, then you probably have a wolf. And if you're getting emails all night long from that boss, then you're probably dealing with a dolphin. Once you know that, then on Friday, you wait till after lunch because there's data to show that people get happier and happier towards the end of the day, and you don't want to hit anybody on an empty stomach. So right around 1 o'clock, if your boss is a lion, that's when you want to hit him because you've got about a 35 to 60-minute window as to how alert and responsive and in a good mood that person is going to be. Then after about uh, maybe two o'clock range, that's when if your boss is a bear, you should hit him. If your boss is a wolf, you probably want to try to do a happy hour or 4.35 o'clock. And if your boss is a dolphin, make sure they're well fed and then you can go at pretty much any time. But I would adopt more of a lion's uh, time for, for asking for a raise. And we've, been, we've discovered that this is actually a very, fairly successful uh, route for many people to take. Dr. Bruce, you're a busy guy spreading the good word, so I know you got to go, but if people want to learn more about you, where can they find you? So if people want to take my quiz, you can go to thepowerofwhenquiz.com, and if people want to learn more about sleep in general, just go to my website, which is thesleepdoctor.com. Dr. Bruce, great stuff. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, Bill. This has been a lot of fun, and uh, thanks to all you listeners. Wishing you all sweet dreams. 
there you have it i hope you guys enjoyed that interview as much as i did again the book is the power of when go get it at your local bookstore or amazon.com i highly recommend it and we also have show notes on everything we discussed on this show today you can get that at anchors of health dot com slash eight and as i mentioned in the intro i created a little pdf cheat sheet on all the action items that we discussed and you can also get that at anchors of health.com slash eight so that's it for me i'll catch you guys in the next one peace